Greetings, and welcome to Flanagan's Ecologic. I am your host, Ted Flanagan. Today, we've got Laura Friedman joining the podcast. Laura started off in the entertainment industry here in L.A. She ran for city council successfully in the city of Glendale, where I live. She was on the council for seven years. She served as the mayor of Glendale before successfully campaigning uh, and winning a seat in the California Assembly in, in 2016. She is now running for the U.S. Congress uh, to be our representative here from the 30th Congressional District in the state of California. So Laura's busy and she's uh, inspiring. I, I'm looking forward to this conversation greatly. Hey, Laura, how are you doing today? Doing great. Happy to be here. How are you, Ted? I'm doing well. I'm doing great. But you're the one. <laughs> you're the one on the go. How's the campaign going? It's going really well. It's busy, as you can imagine, but it's also exciting. And I'm constantly inspired by the people that I get to meet on the campaign trail. People are working so hard on issues, on their community. People care a lot. So it makes you feel better <laughs> to go out and speak to folks. Isn't that great? I mean, you look you look great. You don't you do not look uh, exhausted. You look energetic and ready to go. So uh, how much more, how many more days on the camp of campaigning do you have? I don't know. I don't uh, count off the days, uh, but we have until March, the elections in March, and then we'll have until November. So there's quite a while to go, which sounds like a lot to people. But trust me, as a candidate, it goes by very, very quickly. As, as they say, the days are long, but the years are short. I think that's the expression. Oh. Uh, it's, it was like that with my child when she was little, and I feel the same way with the campaign. It goes, uh, it goes faster than you think it will. Well, let's let's just we're going to be just together for a short while, and then I'll let you get back to it. But let's uh, many people, you know, have done now over a hundred podcasts, and our listeners overwhelmingly like to hear a little bit about your background. And uh, so let's just go through a little bit about your background, and then we'll dig into the council days and the assembly days, and and looking forward, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Uh, so, I was born in New so, York. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I okay. thought you wanted me to. Well, you you can. I you know I thought you were born in South Florida. So go ahead and clarify. There you this. go. See, I I was born in New York, but my parents moved to Florida when I was three years old. Okay. So I was raised in South Florida, but my mother went to Florida very reluctantly. My father got a job. He had been out of work, and he got a job in Florida. And she was very liberal and became an activist in South Florida because it was during the Anita Bryant years. So yep. she founded the first chapter of NOW in Broward County, the National Organization for Women. And I grew up canvassing for the ERA and abortion rights my whole childhood. And um, when I went to college, I swore I was not going to go to law school or go into politics after that experience, although it was wonderful for a child to grow up in that. But I wanted to sort of march my own, march to my own drummers, and I studied film, sure. and worked in New York City, and then got a job at Paramount Pictures in 1992, and moved out to Los Angeles for that job, uh, from New York, and um, had a great career in the film industry for about 25 years, working as a development executive, and not being super politically involved, but being aware and voting and going to campaign events sometimes, but never thinking that I was going to be one of those people one day. And then when yeah. I moved to Glendale in 2000, um, I, I was very involved with historic preservation work around LA County with the LA Conservancy. And I ended up being recruited to be on the city's design review board, which I did for five years really enjoyed it but it's it's ground zero for a lot of the arguments about development in a community neighbor versus neighbor arguments i want a second story on my house you're going to block my view it was it was heated it was a lot of intense stuff and also looking at how we were going to develop as a city and it it definitely brought in my view of 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 my community and what was going on and then i was diagnosed with cancer in 2006 very unexpectedly while i was in my 30s and i had thought about running for city council, but not been serious about it. And then when that happened, I decided that I wanted to do something with my life that I felt would make more of an impact. So I ran for city council and won. And a few months later was able to cast the deciding vote to forever ban the Glendale gun show from happening on city property. And then push the city to do all kinds of green initiatives over the years when they had been really disinterested in that previously. 
um, was really, really proud that we got an award for the best green plan within a few years that we had a bicycle master plan and tried to push the city to be a leader in sustainability where it had been, you know, wasn't on the radar for the city of Glendale prior to that. And then ran so for the, assembly in 2016 and won. Yep. No, let me just back you up a little bit. I, I've got so many questions, but I, hearing yeah. about your mother, I, I kind of explains a lot about you that I didn't know before where, <laughs> where you'd, where you'd got that fire in your belly and the, uh, the, the passion to, to be involved in, in, in policy making, but you went from South Florida for some reason you went to Rochester, which is, I mean, that's, that's pretty cold up there from leaving Florida. It sounded Why really exotic at the time. I thought, Oh, winter, I haven't been through one of those. And look, there's a picture of someone building a snowman on their prospectus. And they also were recruiting students from South Florida. And I wasn't the world's greatest high school student. And I didn't have a great grade point average and I was a debate champion, so that helped. But I um, was very spotty. I, I kind of got a lot of A's and I got a lot of D's and F's also in high school. My high school wasn't the greatest. I went to public school and you know, South Florida public schools weren't the world's greatest schools, but I had a wonderful teacher who was also my debate coach who inspired me and made me realize that I could go to college and could achieve what I wanted. And my parents also were, never left a doubt that I was going to go to college. And most of my high school friends, my close high school friends, none of them went to college. Um, they all went off and became moms and wives and waitresses and things like that. And what, I didn't what was your, what, was, what was your dad's thing? I, he, I know he, he was the one who moved you to Florida, but what, what was his career? My father was a stockbroker. He, he's an immigrant. My father was, uh, uh, grew up in Scotland and was uh, moved to Florida when he, he was maybe 12 years old. Uh, became a stockbroker. And so that's one of the reasons he went to Florida because of all the retirees. He thought, oh, these people might need someone to help them with their retirement and their investments. And that's what he did for his career. That's great. That's great. Now, my mother fast went forward. College when I went to college. When I went to college, she took the opportunity to move back to Boston. The marriage did mm. not survive South Florida. And mm. she went back to college. She had always wanted to be a nurse, but her parents were more traditional and didn't she didn't go to college you know they they sort of said no you should get married have kids so she didn't follow her dreams so when I went to college she moved to up north my sister went to high school in Boston and my mother went to Northwestern and got a nursing degree and became a VA nurse and spent another 30 years being a nurse God, good for you well they, they've obviously they've obviously influenced you and I, I want to talk a little bit more when you're running for council originally in Glendale Sure. That because I, I I think I've heard you speaking about this. I mean, you were just beating the pavement like like I guess all successful politicians do. But but you were breaking some barriers, weren't you? There had not been a woman on the Glendale City Council in ten years. But even worse, I was only the sixth woman to be elected to the Glendale City Council in about a hundred years of the city's history. So they had had a election every two years. They had a five person city council. And had only ever had five women, as far as I can tell, on that city council. Years of history, oh they'd only had five women prior to me serve on the Glendale City Council. So what was the success? What was the, how did you break that barrier? What, what do you a, a, ascribe your success to? I had developed a group of people who trusted me based on my work on my uh, city commission. And I also had this group of, of help, people who helped me primarily women who we, we sat around the, the someone's kitchen table, Elaine Wilkerson, who had been the former planning director for the city. And they stu literally stuffed envelopes for me and met, introduced me to their networks. And I did something like 75 meet and greets, which no one had ever done in the city's history. Normally a lot of the people who ran were kind of chamber of commerce presidents and people who were already known in the business community but I went out of my way to go out to all the residents of the city, to, to renters, to young people, to people who didn't feel that they were always represented, and also to the old guard and to businesses and to people who cared about the environment and the issues I cared about and talked to them directly and got them interested. I discovered that not a lot of people paid attention to the city council. People didn't know what it was, how often it met, what they did. And so I did a lot of pavement walking and educated people about why those local races were really important. And these people were voting for the president. They were voting for 
members of Congress, but they didn't realize the importance of local government. And so I would say the way that your city looks, the way your city develops, whether or not your trash gets picked up on, on time, all of that is city government, not federal government or state government. So those are all very important, but there's also a really important reason to be engaged locally. And so I did get, get overwhelmingly elected even against incumbents. I beat an incumbent to get my seat. And uh, I've always believed that people who are in elected office don't get elected to just disappear into a back room somewhere and make deals or to even to go to Sacramento and just vote on things. I think a big part of our job is engaging the community and keeping them involved and making them be involved in their community as best as they're able. And to foster that dialogue between neighbors, that's so important. It's one of the great joys of doing meet and greet events and doing you know, campaign coffees is that, yeah, I, I hear from people and people hear from me, but they hear from each other. It provides a forum for neighbors to talk to each other about things and that doesn't always happen. I remember having people almost come to blows when I was campaigning in 2009 for my first city council race over whether or not they wanted speed bumps on their street. Some yeah. of the people assumed that everybody in the neighborhood thought exactly like they did, but only when they got together in a living room did they realize that they had disagreements and they had to work things out. And that's a really important part of the civic process. Just that campaigning helps to foster that dialogue. But I also believe that elected officials should help support people who are doing the hard work with nonprofits, with activist groups, with non, you know, with, with anybody in their community that has something to offer. Part of our job is to do that movement building to make big change. And I think because of that, it's been part of the success that I've had as an elected official and in my reelection campaign is that I know that to pass the hard things that I want to get passed, whether it's getting rid of, rid of single use plastics or decarbonizing buildings, I can't do any of that work without the grassroots also supporting it because I've got to get a whole bunch of other members of the legislature, 119 other people to also support all of these measures which are difficult and which have opposition from industry. So I can only do that by working with CalPRIG and working with the single use plastics people and working with mm -hmm. California environmental voters and the Sierra Club. So it's building those movements, let's say in the environmental community that allows us to pass the really meaningful legislation that we need to get passed. So I think you that's know, part of my success as an elected official and as a candidate has to do with that yeah. movement building. Yeah, I, I love what you said about um, about the speed bumps because I, I my neighbors uh, were were uh, a couple lived on Highland Avenue at the time, and they 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 differed within their household between the two of them. They differed about the speed bump issue, and it was pretty pretty contentious, but. But I just, as you were campaigning and you talked about, I mean, you're obviously bringing in change and accountability and, and hope and uh, inspiration, but how did you keep that old guard? Uh, I, I salute you. You kept that old guard, as you said, originally interested and then obviously supporting you. You know, you're never going to get people to agree with you on everything. And, um, and there's always going to be disagreements but I do believe that you can also find common ground a lot of times with folks and trying to explain to people who don't share your perspective why maybe your perspective on things has changed or altered over the years is also a really important that important part of that civic dialogue and I think well, let's talk about the old guard in Glendale and Burbank um, those people have lived in this community a very long time you know 50 60 70 years sometimes and they've seen a lot of change. And change is really difficult for people a lot of times. And some of the change is for the good and some of it is you know, arguably not for the good. And so explaining to people why things have changed and what we need to do to make them better is another very important part of the process. So I've had mm -hmm. to do a lot of explaining to people um, about why Sacramento, for instance, does things on housing. And this has been one of the more contentious issues in our community. Why are we building housing? Why are there apartment buildings now on Central Avenue when before there weren't? There were more commercial buildings. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad, is it a bad thing? And talking about just the reality around those issues and what we can do to, to uplift all boats and make everything better. And also why things aren't necessarily going to stay the same forever. And, you know, that's not a bad thing. So... Yeah. Um, 
so sometimes I'm able to explain to people and sometimes I find out people actually share my opinion. And I wouldn't have thought that to begin with. But when you have someone, let's say from the old guard who realizes all of a sudden that their grandchild can't live in their city anymore, can't afford an apartment or can't find an apartment or can't afford to buy a house. Sometimes that changes their perspective without me having to say a word. So, um, so yes, I still have a lot of friends sort of from the old days in Glendale and sometimes, sometimes you don't anymore. Sometimes you pick up new friends. So, yeah. uh, and sometimes yeah. making the younger generation understand the perspective of the older generation is also a role that I have to play and getting them together to talk to each other so yeah. that there doesn't yeah. have to be so much disagreement. What was it like? What was it like? Uh, you did the council for, I think, seven years total. What was it like becoming the mayor? In Glendale and Burbank, because the mayor revolves, it's really not that much different. You get to run the meeting, which has it, you know, it's, it has its pluses and its minuses. You can set the pace a little bit more. Uh, you can um, change things around on the agenda, but you also have to work harder. <laughs> You've got to be on all the time <laughs> running the meeting. Mm -hmm. So it's fun. Uh, but it's always good to give it up at the end of the year and let someone else do it. But you, you get to that, go to more events, which takes more time. Yeah, um, you become yeah. more of the face of the city. Um, if there's something that happens that's unfortunate, you might have to respond. If there's a crisis, for instance, you'll have to be there. So it's a responsibility, but it's also a great honor to do it. Um, yeah. It's wonderful to say you were the mayor of your city. Yeah. I, I will never forget that. And I'm always grateful to have had that opportunity. It's a fantastic title. And, uh, you know, I could just say as a resident, watching you as a council member and watching you as the mayor, it was, uh, we were all proud of you. So it was, it was great stuff. And, and then this, uh, this, uh, the step to the assembly, what, what, what was that like now, all of a sudden you're, you're going to be, you know, flying to Sacramento. You, I know you've got family here. What was that step all yeah. about? It's certainly different. It's a big adjustment. And I think you never fully, at least for me, for someone who has to travel back and forth, you never, you never aren't somewhat discombobulated because I take my daughter to school on Monday morning and then drive to the airport and fly to Sacramento and go right into meetings and session. And I'm running a million miles an hour when I'm in Sacramento always. There's a gazillion meetings. You're running from committee to committee. People sometimes can't even until they get there and watch, they can't believe the way you have committee meetings happening simultaneously. And you may have to leave a meeting to go and present a bill somewhere. There's a lot of running around. There's a lot of activity in the evenings as well with receptions and events. And you always want to be there to greet people. So maybe I didn't want to go to a particular event, but I find out there's a group of Glendale or Burbank constituents there that are there with their association. So of course I'm going to go and greet them and thank them for traveling to Sacramento. So there's always a lot happening. And then Thursday we have session again. And then I leave session and fly home uh, and pick up my daughter from school uh, when she gets off of school. <laughs> and then there's always the district events over the weekend. There's more events than you could possibly attend because we are such a vibrant and diverse community. So it's exciting and it's a lot, but it keeps me energized. It keeps me going. To me, the hardest balance has been the, the work family balance. I'm having a young child while I've been in the legislature has been hard, mostly for my daughter. You know, Rachel was three years old when I was elected. She was in the stroller when I was campaigning. I took her canvassing with me many times. And uh, she's grown up with me having that schedule and being in the legislature. So it's hard for her. She kind of understands what I do. She's 10 years old now. And I think she likes some of it, but she also wants her mommy around more. So that can be heartbreaking for a mom to have your daughter say, I wish you weren't going to Sacramento this week. Why do you have to go yeah. to Sacramento? And explaining to her what, what public service means and that there are a lot of people who sacrifice a lot more than we do. You know, a, a mom who's working two jobs to make ends meet and going to the bus every day and having to, you know, deal with taking care of her kids maybe when maybe she's by her herself. Maybe she's not, but there are people who are working families, families in poverty, where I would say that they have a lot more sacrifice that they make for their, their children. And it's a lot harder for those kids. So trying to explain to my daughter that we fight for those people, that we do this so that those people can have a better life. Um, I think she gets it, but it's still, it's still a lot. Yeah. It's, it, it, I'm, I'm sure she's very, very proud of you, but, but then there's all these emotional, I want my, 
I want my mother there around is, more and more in my life. I took class at Franklin and did a Zoom with the whole fourth grade class or third grade class. Uh, and she was the most popular kid in school for a week. So she really liked that. So there's sort of, there's some, <laughs> some perks that she gets along the way. She gets to go to Sacramento and come to session with me sometimes. And she may take it for granted now, but I think later on that's going to be a really special thing for her. And look, if she's going to be a Supreme Court justice someday, it's better for her to understand now what politics is all about. Well, that's for sure. Is that her goal? No, it's my or goal. You're, just, you're, just, you're, you're, laying, you're laying that out there. I'm laying let's, the before groundwork we, out. It's before we move into the future, let, let's talk a little bit more about some of your key accomplishments in Glendale as a, as a council member. You, you mentioned a few, but what, what, when, when you reflect back, what, what, are the, what are the handful of accomplishments that you're most proud of? Well, preventing that gun show from operating at the Glendale Civic Center right across from our community college is something I'm very proud of. Uh, I don't want, you know, we, there's still guns that are sold in the city, but if there was going to be an atrocity, I'd never wanted to wake up and find out that that gun was sold through the city of Glendale. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't mm -hmm. think that the city had any business being in the, arm, the, the, the business of selling weapons and selling guns, right, especially across from a community college and up the block from an elementary school. So I'm very proud that we were able to do that when I came on council. It was not possible before that. They had tried in the past, but it took getting you know somebody different with different priorities elected to council to have that happen. I was very proud to have a green plan that we were able to adopt and to try to get the city moving towards a 100% renewable goal. And I was also very proud to have been there when we approved the bridge that's going to connect Glendale to Griffith Park and then to have gotten about $35 million, 30, $35 million, I don't have the figure in front of me, for the city to have that bridge financed by the state of California. Uh, it's something that I was very proud of and I got 100% of the financing that was needed to, to build that bridge. And just to put that in perspective, we have about 100,000 people who live within about a mile and a half of where that bridge is going to go in Glendale. So within walking and biking distance. Right now, those same people, if you're in that area, you're probably taking the highway, the 134, to get into Griffith Park, or you're driving over Los Villas Boulevard, which is completely congested, or all the way around through the city of Burbank and through the backside of Griffith Park, uh, causing traffic in our Rancho area and throughout Glendale. This will be a safe way for people to walk and bike across a pedestrian and, and cyclist bridge to get from Glendale for the very first time directly into Griffith Park. And the city of Los Angeles has committed to doing the infrastructure on their side to make it safe for people and also to run their free bus shuttle service so that you could get across the bridge, get picked up by a bus and then be taken up to the Griffith Park Observatory mm. or go throughout mm. the park, go to the zoo, go to the Autry Museum if you don't wanna walk to take the free bus to get there. So we have really great connectivity plans. And actually I think that bus will also take you in the future to the Red Line train station. So you can take the subway then Oh, uh, into downtown yeah. LA or to North Hollywood. Very so there's cool. really now, great isn't, connectivity. Laura, Laura isn't the, the bridge? That'll also take you to the LA River bike path where you can then bike yeah. all the way to Long yeah. Beach if you want. Right. I thought the bridge was built. Or is it a different no, bridge we're talking this about? This is a different bridge. There's a bridge that was built in Atwater. Okay. But the white the white one with the spire with the spire. Correct. This is one that would go right by where Grayson Power Plant is to where the soccer fields and the dog park are in Griffith Park. I see. We yeah. also got the funding to help City of LA build a bridge to go under the 134 so that we can also have a bike path on our side of the river and have people be able to, to have more connectivity on a protected bike lane away from traffic yeah. and away from roads. That's so that's a stuff. really exciting thing that I started in Glendale, but was able to continue in the state. Good stuff. And, and so let, let's shift to the, the, assemb the assembly days or years. Again, yes. you were on the Natural Resources Committee, the Transportation Committee, Select Committee on Urban Development to combat climate change. What was that last committee? What, what, have, you, what have you done in that committee that you want to talk right. about? Right. So these are all committees that I chaired. And I'm really proud of the accomplishments that I, the uh, legislation that I authored, but of also helming that committee and, and shepherding all the legislation that went through those committees to really center equity and climate and our environment and to um, think about how we are developing, where we're putting our resources, the impact that we have on disadvantaged communities and, and traditionally uh, polluted and marginalized communities, and with an eye towards 
making a better quality of life for everybody in California. So the last committee you asked about, which was a select committee that I formed on climate change and urban development, was really look, thinking about how we develop sustainably, how we move into the future and account for population growth and where people are going to live, but to do it in a way that is sustainable, meaning really a few things. First of all, making sure that we protect our valuable open space and our biodiversity and our wildlife so that we don't sprawl across farmlands that we need and our precious open space and forested areas that we all love in California. We love our natural resources. We love our forests. We love our deserts. We love our oceans. And we don't want to see sprawl developments just taking over those areas as we, as we sometimes have seen in the past and still see, unfortunately, today. So how do we preserve those open spaces? And secondly, how do we then make the investment that we need so that if we develop our urban infrastructure and, uh, and do urban infill, how do we do it in a way that is additive and doesn't negatively impact people who are already living there? So in the transportation space, that looks like more investments in public transportation to build out our light rail system, our subways, our other mass transit like bus rapid transit, so that we can add people without adding to congestion and that we can relieve the, the, the congestion that we have now that's so awful for everybody in Los Angeles. You know, every time I cross our city, I look at how long it will take me to drive and how long it would take me if I took public transportation. Because I love taking the Beeline bus and I love public transportation. I'm from New York and Boston, and I know how wonderful it is to be car free. But unfortunately, in Los Angeles, it's typical that those public transportation times are two to four times longer than if you were going to drive. And we need to flip that switch. Right. So we're not taking people's cars away. You're still going to have that option. But wouldn't it be great if rather than being stuck in traffic for two hours to get from Glendale to the beach, you could get on light rail right in Glendale and be at the beach in a half an hour or 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah, or without instead any, of going to work without any parking LA, hassle. Yeah. Right. And not dealing with the parking hassle and everything else. You know, younger people now. So we talked before about old guard, new guard. The younger people today are not saying that they that the first thing that they, most important thing they need in their life is a car like they did 20, 30 years ago. 20, 30 years ago, if you ask someone 19, 20 years old, what's the number one thing you're looking forward to, to having, they would say a car. Because that was mobility, that's how you got around, that was freedom. Today they say a cell phone, that that's the most essential thing. And today they say, you know what? I don't wanna pay $25,000, $30,000 for a car and then pay another $10,000 or you know to put gas in it and insure it say, you know, I've done the calculation and if I can take public transportation and take Uber everywhere, then it's easier for me. I can get around faster. I don't need just to have that expense. And so we see people now shifting the way they want to live and we need to meet them where they're at too. So we have ride share for that first mile, last mile. A lot more young people want to take a scooter or a bike around. We have e-bikes that make it easier to get up and down hills. And we need to make the investments in the infrastructure that we need to be more sustainable because we can't grow as a city and house everybody and have everybody driving everywhere. We see where that's yeah. led us with a housing shortage yep. and a huge problem with congestion. So what that committee was about was how we can move forward and do the, and do the kind of land use planning that we need and the investments that we also need to make that a better quality of life for everybody and, and, and something that is then more equitable for people who are low income and really um, burdened by the cost of either owning their own vehicle or by the time it takes to get around through public transportation. So that's what that committee right. was about. Well, I just love hearing you you talk. It's just, it just what your message is just spot on as far as I'm concerned about, you know, raising the quality of life. Um, we're we're, wrap, we're wrap, wrapping down, wrapping up here, I guess, at this point. Uh, but I did want to talk to you about Washington and your desire to be in sure. the U.S. Congress. And I just imagine just as you were sort of working at you know, you were working at the city level and then you went to the state level. And now you want to take all of these, all of this integration uh, of, of ideas and policy and, and take it to the national level. Is it, You're just, I take it you're just driven to make a difference. Well, I am. And I've done all this work over the years now in the legislature, trying to get toxic materials out of our mattresses, out of our cosmetics, PFOS, out of children's clothing, dealing with the impact of all of these pollutants on our water system. And I do a lot of legislation around water, our air quality and everything else. And I feel like I shouldn't have to do that because we have an EPA that's supposed to keep us safe and but fails us. 
I look at the investments that come in from the federal government for transportation, and so much of it still goes to widening highways and road capacity projects. And we know where that goes. That leads to just more and more cars on the road, more air pollution, and a worse quality of life for everyone because you're stuck in traffic all the time. Uh, I look at particularly my mother's life's work. You know, my mother spent her whole life trying to get a woman's right to choose in law. And I marched for that my whole childhood. And over the years, I've seen our gay and lesbian and transgender community get the right to marry and the right to be free of discrimination. And I feel like our minority communities are, you know, we're starting to see more about, you know, activating communities and access to the ballot box. And I always thought that as a country, when you get freer that you get free more and more free that when you get civil rights you kind of get more and more civil rights and we refine and we care about equity and we try to make people more um have equal opportunities and yet in the last several years i've seen the opposite happen where we've seen rights being taken away we see gerrymandering where people aren't even pretending anymore that it's not about disenfranchising black and brown communities and making it harder for people to vote and making sure that they can't get their representatives elected. And I never thought that that was what America was about as daughter of, of an immigrant and uh, of an, a mother who, and a, a grandmother for that matter, who marched for my right to have an abortion and, and, and be the, the sole person who decided if and when I was gonna have a child. And so I feel very driven now to go to Washington to fight for all the things that that generation fought for and thought that they had enshrined in law forever. I, I can't stay home. I can't stay home. And I'm giving up another four years in the legislature, a job that's the best job I've ever had in my life, that I absolutely love, because the work that I need to do, the fight is in the federal government for the things that I care about the most, for the future of our planet, for the future of our civil rights, for my daughter, who's 10 now, to not have to grow up in a world where her rights are taken advantage or taken away. Uh, I need to be in Washington to do that. So I'm very excited about this race. I'm very inspired and I'm very determined to, to go there for my community. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you for all your service. Good luck with the campaign. And uh, thanks for being on this podcast today. I've really, really enjoyed this. And I'm sure our listeners will be inspired by, by you as well. Well, thanks, thanks Ted. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's always great to see you. Likewise. Well, I'll see you in the neighborhood. See you in the neighborhood. Take care. That's it. Thanks for listening to Flanagan's Ecologic. We'll see you next time.